welcome everyone. Welcome to the Zoom room. Welcome to Facebook. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. We're glad to have you here. If you're new here, if this is your first, second, or third time visiting um, a service or listening to a service with St. Paul's, we want to make sure we acknowledge you. So if you are in the Zoom room, we're going to ask you to type the words new here. Just say new here, and there'll be people who will welcome you. So glad to, to see you and that you're here. Same thing on Facebook. If you are on Facebook and this is your, you're just visiting, you're not a member of our church and you, this is your first, second or third time visiting, we wanna, wanna know. So please type new here in the comments in Facebook and we will be getting in touch with you just after service, okay? So uh, to welcome you and let you know that we appreciate you taking time to come to worship with us. We want to also take time, speaking of welcome, to welcome two more new members. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We want to welcome Cassandra Outlaw Langston and Kashik George, two new members to St. Paul's Church family. Welcome family. So glad that you have joined us. Welcome family. Next up, as we mentioned earlier, in the state of Pennsylvania, we have moved to the green phase, which means certain things. We want to make sure that you are aware of how we should navigate and the relaunch task team has done so. So let's just take a look at this week's video for the relaunch task team. Most of us in it's very important for us to remain through hand washing, and social distancing. However, today I want to talk about the children. With summer camps opening and sports activities resuming, it's important for us to monitor our children during this reopening phase. Children can present with the typical symptoms of COVID-19. However, in addition, they can also present with symptoms of fever, abdominal pain, vomit and diarrhea, back pain, neck pain, rash, bloody shot eyes, and feeling extremely tired. All these symptoms can be indicative of MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which we've been hearing about, and there are 25 cases in Pennsylvania. If your child or any children that you know of presents with these symptoms, please immediately contact their primary care physician or their pediatrician. If you need any further information about MISC, please go to the CDC's website. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Here we go. So I'm going to just mute all the lines again because we have people who are on. It's a little bit noisy. And let's jump right back into that presentation, okay? Um, because we have announcements for this week that you need to be aware of. There's lots happening at St. Paul's. Um, we have not slowed down. So this week, uh, there is Adult Sunday School at 12. Please make note. Uh, also, the Let's Talk with Teens will occur this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We do have pastor's prayer call at seven on Monday and the Cairo 316 prayer line. Can I ask that you make your line, please? Maya, can you grab that, please? And we have to underscore two of these three facilities are for profit detention prison companies. Hold on there a second, no I got to gotta grab that so we can make sure we can hear. There we go. That helps. Okay, let's jump back over here. Very good. Um, I think I was at Kairos 316 is actually um, happening every week uh, day, Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. But this week especially, please be aware that we have the Black History Camp uh, sponsored by SABA Enrichment Academy. So they will be meeting every day uh, this coming week at 10 a.m. You do need to be registered to attend that those sessions, but this is summer camp, just like you would send your children to summer camp. This is an opportunity for children and adults to learn about Black history and what better time to do it. Also, please note that there will not be Bible study this week. There will be no Bible study this week on July 1st. However, we will have a uh, Bible study starting next week with Reverend Rochelle Gunter, who will be talking about what justice is this. So please join us next week for Bible study. Okay. In regards to giving, 
again, we want you to be aware that there are still five ways in which you can give. You can give via smartphone text. Right now, you can text 84321 with the amount that you would like to give. Um, and that there are options, which you'll see more pre predominantly in the mobile app or on the website. And so you can choose uh, along with your tithes and offerings to also uh, provide an offering for Black Lives Matter, for Saba Academy, our quilting ministry, which provided masks for free to, to hundreds of people, uh, the nursery, the Sunday school building, of course, Men and Women's Day scholarship, uh, which helps to provide scholarships for our young people uh, going into uh, college. And then uh, for the mortgage reduction and for missions. So you do have options in which that you can give and you will find those options most readily on the mobile app and on our website. And with that, I thank you all for your attention and we will hear from our pastor, Pastor Wayne Croft Sr. Just have to unmute you, Pastor. Hello, good morning, everyone, and praise the Lord. It's so good to scroll down and see all of you. Um, missing you dearly and um, praying that you are all well, blessed, and safe. This morning, scripture comes from Psalm uh, 3, the third division of the Psalms, verse 1. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. Selah. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill. Selah. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. Rise up, O Lord. Deliver me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessings be on your people. Selah. Be careful not to listen to your enemies. You'll overcome 
for sin his hands this too Amen. Would you praise God with me for Sister Cassandra Jones, who has blessed our hearts and our souls. This too shall pass. I want to read again the scripture for you for today's sermon. Psalm 3. O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you and God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy hill, Selah. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. Rise up, O Lord. Deliver me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessings be on your people. Selah. Even though Christ has promised us life and life more abundantly, most people do not experience the fullness of life because they allow certain people to distract them. You know who they are. Some of us may have them in our life today. We can't shake them, brush them off, or act like they don't exist. And even if we had the money, we couldn't pay them off. They are who they are, and they act the way they act. And if we can stand to hang around them long enough, we will see that they don't just act that way with us, but most almost everyone they come in contact with. The reality is we have to deal with these types of people because they are not going anywhere. And many of them will never change. They may change from time to time as it pertains to their personal name, but who they are and what they are and what they do to us never changes. They are not one size fit all, no, they come in all shapes, colors, genders, and sizes. They talk to us when they have to, but at the same time, they talk about us, and oftentimes they do it behind our back, seeking to discredit us. Some of them have disguised themselves as friends, while others can be identified by name. I think way back in the early 70s, an R&B group known as the OJs exposed who they are and who I'm talking about. 
The OJ said, they smile in your face all the time they want to take your place, those backstabbers. Such people are like, you remember, baby kids. They don't die, they multiply. Who are these people that I'm talking about? To some, they are known as enemies. To others, they are known as foes. And still to others, they are known as critics. Each of these personalities are known for at least one thing, and that one thing is to criticize. The difference between people is not that some people are criticized and others are not. The difference is that some people are stimulated, motivated, and driven by criticism while others are halted, discouraged, or stopped by it. So that on one hand, criticism can stimulate us to higher achievement, but on the other hand, for some, it can become a roadblock that can prevent them from experiencing a full and abundant life. Why do I mention all of this? Well, in Psalm 3, David, the king of Israel, is on the run from his enemies who are criticizing him publicly. Their negative criticism, as well as their treachery, plunges David into despair for a moment. David teaches us in Psalm 3 how to respond to our enemies and our critics who seek to destroy us. If your Bible provides with you a heading, then it tells you that this is a Psalm of David. This is the first psalm of which David is said to be the author and the first psalm that is given a, a historical setting. David wrote this psalm during a time when he felt as if his life was falling apart. He had been forced to flee from Jerusalem and the treachery of his son Absalom. Israel had chosen David as their king, but more importantly, God had already anointed David as the king of Israel. And as king, David is about to learn like many of us have learned, that when God elevates us, there will not only be enemies in our life who will try to pull us down, but also critics who will try to attempt to wear us down with their words. King of Israel, David, uh, being the king, had the authority and power to re render justice. And whenever justice is rendered, there are those who will be happy with the outcome, and there are those who will not. 2 Samuel chapter 15 and chapter 16 records what transpired that led David to write Psalm 3. Absalom, David's son, became envious and wanted his father's David throne. While David was inside the kingdom rendering judgment like a king does, Absalom, his son, stood outside the kingdom at the gate waiting for those who had been judged to come out. If one came out not agreeing with David's decision, uh, Absalom would hold a conversation with them on the outside of the kingdom. Absalom would say to them, you know, if I had been king, the verdict would have been different. In fact, if I had been king, you would have been pleased with my decision because my decision would have gone in your favor. Absalom continued by saying, oh, that I were made judge in this land then every person who came to me, I would do justice. And Absalom would do this over and over again. If I was king, I would have done. And you know, and I know people who always say what they would have done if they were in our shoes, but we never know what we would do if we were in someone else's shoes. In fact, whenever someone came towards Absalom, Absalom would take his or her hand and kiss it. He carried out this act to every person that came to David for judgment to the point that 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 6 says that Absalom stole the hearts of the people of Israel. In a matter of time, Absalom, David's own son, turned the people's heart against David, the king's his father. The, the conspiracy brought about uh, Absalom becoming so strong that the Bible says that the people increased continually with Absalom. A few days later, a messenger came to David to inform him that the hearts of the people of Israel were, were with his son Absalom, no longer with him. And upon hearing this, this message, David and a few servants he had left were forced to flee Israel in order to save their lives. Absalom and the people David once ruled over and had taken into numerous victories, those people began planning a way to kill the now runaway king, David. Needless to say, David's heart is broken. His dreams for Israel have been shattered. His, the nation is in turmoil. The kingdom was split. Uh, David's family had been torn apart, and his life was now in jeopardy. It was 
within this stormy and sad background that David picks up his pen, pens the words we read in Psalm 3, gives it to Joab, his commander in chief to read. But it's also within this terrible setting that God further shapes David into a man after God's own heart. You know, and I know that God often uses strange tools to shape us into the person God wants us to be. I don't know how God does it, but God will often use trouble to teach us how to trust him. Sickness to teach us how to lean on him. Betrayal to teach us how to turn to him. Enemies to teach us how to run to him. Empty pockets and bank accounts to teach us how to depend on him. Storms to teach us how to hold on to him. Dark days to teach us how to look for him. And critics to teach us how to listen to him. It is often through these strange and unusual tools that God shapes us into the person God wants us to be. That is, if we allow these tools to make us better rather than bitter. It's a dark day and time in David's life. And yet David opens this psalm by going to God in prayer. This is a good move on David's part for testimonies and history verify that God answers prayer. This is what David does. David turns to God in prayer in the midst of feeling as if his life is falling apart. It's a good move on David's part for testimonies and histories verify that God answers prayer. This is the reason James said in his epistle that, prayer, that the prayers of the righteous avail of much. He said this because God answers prayers. It is why Paul admonishes us to pray without ceasing. Paul says this because God answers prayers. It is why Jesus said that we ought to always pray and not faint. He said this because his, he knows God, his father, answers prayers. Testimonies prove and history verifies that God still answers prayer. Hezekiah prayed and God added 15 years to his life because God answers prayers. Elijah prayed and defeated the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel because God answers prayer. Hannah prayed for a son and God gave her a son. She prayed because she knows God, she knows God answers prayers. Peter was in jail and the church prayed for him. Angels came and took Peter out of jail so the jailers and the church would know that God answers prayer. And you remember Jesus prayed over two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 people, not including women and children, because God answers prayers. And I'm sure that there are a few of you who have been in trouble, had to deal with some enemies, flee from some foes, correct some critics, and silence some haters. And you can testify that God answers prayers. Somebody's been sick and God healed you. Somebody's been without a job and God provided for you. Somebody was lost and God found you. You know, and I know that God answers prayer. David takes his troubles to God in prayer. And it's amazing that David does not begin this psalm with some introductory remarks like he does in most of his psalms. No, he doesn't use introductory remarks to prepare us for what he's about to say. No, David gets right to the point. You see, the word psalm comes from the Hebrew word mizmor, which has to do with pruning and cutting off. In other words, David cuts off, prunes away any introductory flowery phrases or impressive words and gets right to the point. Many are my foes, God. He is in trouble and feeling the burden that comes with disappointment, and he does not have time to impress anyone. You see, when our lives seem to be falling apart or we are in trouble or maybe surrounded by our enemies, we don't have time to pray a King James Version Elizabethan language prayer like thou who art the eschatological manifestation of the ground being the charisma come to the cosmos to show forth thy ontological deity and release me from the existential malady. No, when we are in trouble like David, sometimes we, we have to just fall on our knees and immediately tell God our problems, hoping God will respond and act expeditiously or let us know that he cares for us. When my children were young and were hungry, they didn't come to me with some great flowery speech, thou father who feedeth us when we are hungry, you who sit high on the throne at home, please in you and your yet somewhat finite wisdom, order us some Domino's pizza. No, they said, dad, we're hungry, our stomachs are growling and Domino delivers. David removes the flowery phrases, gets to the point and cries out in the first verse, 
Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? David doesn't have time for any flowery words. He's in trouble and he needs God to come rescue him. There was one particular foe, foe that greatly troubled David. And it was his son, Absalom. Absalom, how, however, the troubles David and, 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 and David's troubles multiply because now no longer was it just Absalom criticizing David's rule, but Absalom had raised an army, a group of enemies and critics to come against David. Thus, David doesn't just have Absalom on his heels now. He also has critics in his ear, but he's wise enough to tell God about it. The, the problem is, David first focused on his enemies and his critics. Listen again to what David says in the first verse. He says, oh Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? When we focus solely on our enemies, our foes, or our critics, it will appear that we have more enemies than encouragers, more foes than friends, and more critics than confidants. And our critics and enemies will always have something to say. In verse two, David's enemies and critics tells him he's done for, and there's no help for him in God. I, however, like what David does in verse three in response to what his enemies say. He hears what they say to him, and in verse two, as they state, there is no help for you in God, David decides not to listen to his enemies, but rather turn his attention towards God. You see, when we, when we turn our attention uh, from God, all we see is hopelessness, defeat, and despair. But when we turn our attention towards God, we see that God's strength is greater than our enemies, that God's presence is greater than our fears, that God's deliverance is greater than our trouble, and God's power is greater than our stronghold. God is always more powerful greater and stronger than our enemies or whatever we are going through. How do I know, know this? David says, I know what my enemies have to say. But in verse three, David says, but you, O Lord, that's a Holy Ghost conjunction again, but you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You're my glory and the one who lifts up my head. He goes on to say in verse four, I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy hill. David turns his attention from his enemies to, and turns his eyes toward God. And as soon as he turns his attention towards God, David is reminded of how strong God is and how manageable his critics and enemies are. And he tells us four things about God. First, he says, God is a shield around him. That every time David found himself in trouble or his enemies came against him, God was there to protect him. Second, he says, God would lift up his head that whenever he was severely cast down, God came along and encouraged him and lift his bow down head. Third, he said, thirdly, he said, God was his glory, which meant God was more to him than all the riches of David's earthly kingdom. And lastly, he says, God had a sympathetic ear that God heard him from his holy hills, that God heard his prayers. Know that when your life seems to be falling apart and your enemies are on your heels, once you focus on God and not your enemies, you'll see that you have have a God who is a shield against your enemies, a lifter up of your head and a responder to your prayers. Where did David get this confidence from all of a sudden? Well, there is one significant word that is inserted three times in this psalm, and we talked about it in the past. It's the word Selah. Did you catch it? Selah is a musical note. Selah means to lift up. It, it is thought to be a kind of crescendo mark in music. It is, it, is a, it is causing us, when you see Selah, Selah in the Bible means to Paul. However, another explanation is that the word Selah means to stop, think about it, or there. What do you think about that? Selah was a reminder to the musician to pause and think about what was just said and to ask, what do you think about that? Look, look, at, look at when David uses the word Selah in, in this psalm. He, he uses it in verse two when he says, many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. Selah, what do you think about that? He, he used it in verse four when he says, I cry aloud to the Lord 
And he answers me from his holy hill, Selah. What do you think about that? He uses it in verse eight when he says, deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessings be on your people, Selah. What do you think about that? Notice every other verse, David focused on God after what his enemies said, and he paused, and he thought about who God is and what God is able to do, and he looked at his enemies and said, what do you think about that? But, but that's not all. Once David turned his attention from his enemies to God, verse 5 lets us know that he was able to get a good night's sleep. He says in verse 5, I lie down and sleep. I wake again for the Lord sustains me. Verse 5 is probably the most appealing part of this psalm. As, as David tells us how with critics around him, enemies in his ear, danger lurking near him, and a rebellious son and his enemies and critics on his heels, David says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again for the Lord sustains me. David is saying, while I am sleeping, God is working. And when I wake up, I realize God sustained me. It's a wonderful picture of one trusting God to the point that they are able to sleep soundly even while others are talking about them. David must have concluded since God never sleeps nor slumbers, there was no use in God in him not getting any sleep. David must have thought to himself, there's nothing I can do about this problem tonight. I might as well go to sleep and let the one who never sleeps work it out. But know that one sleeping like David is dependent upon one, upon who one places their trust in and who they choose to listen to, God or their enemies. David is able to sleep at night, even with trouble lurking, even when he's feeling like his life is falling apart because the Lord sustains him. I don't know about you, but I made up in my mind not to listen to my enemies. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to God who, despite my enemies, continues to tell me, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I'm not listening to my enemies, my foes or critics, for if I listen to them, I'll be in a rut, in a jam, up a creek without a paddle between a rock and a hard place, bamboozle, run amok. I would not land on Plymouth Rock, but Plymouth Rock would land on me. So I made up in my mind to listen and place my trust in God. And listen, once David takes his eyes off his enemies, his vernacular changes. He declares in verse six, I am not afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. Then in verse seven, he cries out, rise up, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. Verse seven is probably the most peculiar verse in all of this. It actually changes the genre of this psalm. This psalm began as what is known as a psalm of thanksgiving. It is a personal thanksgiving to God who answered the prayer of an afflicted soul. But verse, but, but, but verse 7 turns it into what is known as an, an, an imprecatory psalm. Many, many Christians regularly read the psalms devotionally, and we find great comfort in promises that the Lord is a caring shepherd in Psalm 23 and a refuge and strength in times of trouble in Psalms 46. However, mixed among the beautiful poetry of the Psalms are a number of shocking and disturbing prayers known as the imprecatory Psalms, in which the psalmist petitions God to bring curse and death upon their enemies. You heard David talk about it. And we, see, we also see this in Psalms 58, verse 6. The psalmist says, break the teeth in their mouth, O God. And verse 7, he says, of chapter 58, he says, the righteous will be glad when they bath, bathe their feet in the blood of the wicked. In Psalms 137, 8 and 9, we read, blessed is he who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. These are barbaric words, broken teeth, bloody baths, and baby bashing. When reading in precatory Psalms, though, we must remember that the psalmists often express their prayers to God and highly figurative and, 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 and with hyperbole uh, language, rather than reading the curses and imprecations in the Psalms in a strictly literal manner, we must understand that the psalmist is simply expressing the death 
of their emotion, the severity of their suffering, and the urgence of their need for divine intervention. This is what David is doing when he says in verse seven, when he says, you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. When David says, you break the teeth of the wicked again, he is engaging in hyperbole. What he is really saying is God had broken the teeth of the ungodly, meaning that though they could still bite, they couldn't really hurt David anymore. God made them harmless. God took away their strength. God took away their bite. God made them harmless to me. God took away their strength. God used his strength to give me strength in order to get through what my enemies were trying to do to me. Thus David cries out in the last verse, deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessings be on your people. It's almost as if David realized how much in control God was and not his enemies and stopped listening to his enemies. David then broke out in a shout and said, deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessings be on your people. Selah, what do you think about that? Deliverance belongs to the Lord so that failure is not the last word. Defeat is not the last word. Our problems are not the last word. Disappointment is not the last word. Despair is not the last word. Loneliness is not the last word. Guilt and shame are not the last words. For deliverance, David says, belongs to the Lord, and we can rejoice in that. David was not depending on his troops or his counselors or, or on any military strategy. Rather, he acknowledges that victory would come from God alone. So in spite of what your enemies, foes, or critics say or do, listen to God. Trust God and God's word. Never give up on God. I, I think I need to tell somebody that no matter what you are going through, no matter whom your enemies are, and no matter what others are saying, and no matter what you are experiencing during this pandemic, never ever give up on God, but rather trust him and listen to him. There are a lot of voices out there, but who are you listening to? I'm listening to, I'm not listening to my negative critics who say there's no help for me and God. No, I'm listening to God who tells me that no weapon that is formed against me shall be able to prosper and every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment, God will condemn. I'm listening to God who tells me he'll prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He'll anoint my head with foil and he'll make my cup running over. No, I'm listening to God who tells me to fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, but they soon shall be cut down like the green grass and wither as the green earth. I'm listening to God who tells me that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm listening to God who tells me the glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation work patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope makes not a shame because the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. I'm listening to God who reminds me that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. When my life seems to be falling apart, when your life seems to be falling apart, when our enemies are in our ear and we don't know exactly what to do, we've done listen to the news until we don't have any hope right now. No, I'm going to listen to the voice of God. Who are you going to listen to? I made up my mind that I'm not going that I'm not going to listen to my enemies and my critics who try to pull me down and discourage me. I'm not worried about CNN, MSNBC, CNNBC, or even Fox. I'm listening to God. I made up my mind that I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to have faith in God. I'm going to put my hope in God. I'm going to lean on God because what a fellowship it is. What a joy to bond. Leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness. What a peace of mind. Leaning on the everlasting all. I don't know about you, but in the midst of all that is going on in this world, I'm leaning on Jesus Christ, my Savior, safe and secure for all alarm, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting. Let my enemies do and say what they want. I've already been lied on, cheated, talked about, mistreated. I've been rebuked, scorned, talked about, short your born. I've been up, down, almost leveled to the ground. But as long as I got King Jesus, the lifter of my head, I don't need nobody else, but it all depends on 
who are you going to listen to? I'm listening to God because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I'm listening to God. He shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I'm, I'm listening to God in the time of trouble. He shall hide me in his pavilion and in the secret of his tabernacle shall he have. I'm listening to God when my mother and father forsake me. Then the Lord shall take me. I'm listening to God. They that wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. I'm listening to God because my hope and my trust is in he who is my deliverer, the glory, and the lifter up of my head. And he'll make sure that in spite of what my enemies say, I'll get a good night's sleep because he'll give me a peace that surpasses all understanding. Hallelujah. Be careful who you listen to. God, we thank you and we bless your name for who you are and what you're able to do. Not only when our life is all together, but even when our life seems to be falling apart. Many, God, are experiencing so many things during these last few months that oftentimes God removes or causes us to lose hope to become weary and tired, to raise the question that the psalmist raised in Psalm 13, how long, O oh Lord? But God, when the news becomes too much, when the enemy gets in our ear, when the critics are saying things to bring us down, when it feels like, God, we are just tired and sick and tired of being sick and tired, God, speak to us. Help us to listen to you and your word, to give us strength, to give us hope, to restore our joy, to give us peace, to help us not only sleep, but rest at night. Waking up knowing that you sustain us, as the psalmist says. We need you now than we've, more than we've ever needed you before. We're in a situation we've never found ourselves in in this world. And so God, we need you. Many of our foes, many say, they are, there's no help for you and God, but you are Lord. Oh Lord, are our shield, our deliverer, our glory, the lifter up of our head. Help us to be able to say, I lay down and sleep. I wake up and the Lord sustains me. Rise up, oh Lord, and deliver. For you are a deliverer. Thank you for your word. Thank you for whispering your promises in our ears to remind us not to give up, but to hold on. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. Who are you listening to? Hallelujah. Who are you listening to? Oh, thank you, Lord God. We thank you, God. So, so right now, there's an opportunity, right? There's an opportunity to get to know the God who you get to listen to, to hear his voice and recognize it so that you don't have to listen to your enemies anymore. And if you don't know that voice, if you don't know who God is, we offer you the opportunity to get to know him right now. If you want to know who God is, you get the opportunity to know him right now. So we ask if you want to know who God is, who Jesus is. We ask that in the Zoom room, type Jesus in the, the chat window. And if you're on Facebook, we're gonna ask you to type Jesus on Facebook in the comments. If you don't know who God is and you want to be able to listen to the power and the promises of God, we have an opportunity right now to, to talk with you a little bit further and share that with you. On the other hand, if you already know God's voice, if you've already listened to the voice of God yeah. and you are not with a church home or a church family and, and you have been able to fellowship with us and, and the Lord has, has settled it in your heart that St. Paul's is the place for you to join, the church family to join with, we're gonna ask that you type the word join in the chat window in the Zoom or join on Facebook in the comments so that we can reach out to you and talk to you. 
here in the Zoom chat room. We're going to ask you to stay on. If you type Jesus or join, we're going to ask you to stay on after service is over. We have some people who want to talk to you immediately. If you're on Facebook and you type the word Jesus or join because you want to hear God's voice and you want to know what those promises are, uh, we will be following up with you. Look for a message from uh, in your inbox from Eden Carlton. That would be me. And we will connect you again with people who will start you and help you along that part of the journey. So again, we just thank you for those who may want to connect. I want to know God's voice. I want to know who he is. I want to be part of this church family. Type Jesus or join. Yeah. Amen. 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 I pray you were blessed as I, 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 I think I blessed myself. Um, there's so much being said today um, that can discourage us and, and cause us to wonder if there's any hope, but there's always hope in Christ. And I pray that you will listen to God. Our critics can give us good criticism that can make us uh, look at ourselves and reevaluate some things in our lives, but our critics and enemies can also give us negative things to wear us down. But our God is our glory and the lifter up of our head. And I pray that you put your trust in God through all that we are experiencing right now. I love you and I pray God continues to bless and keep you. Let me bless you with this benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.